respect her, you know? Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, you know, I don't have my phone. We're thankful and grateful today for Bible another Lord? opportunity to seek the Lord and draw close to Him. And seeking the Lord and drawing close to Him just, it just arrives, derives around corporate worship, you know? Corporate worship. Uh, it is what it is. And I'm thankful and grateful. So uh, we usually start off by uh, song this moment. My wife didn't bring a phone today, so I don't guess we got so one. Got one. You got one in there? Okay, well, go ahead. Read up Psalms for us. And let's get started here. Okay, today's song is Psalms 1, 5 and 6. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Lord know the way of the righteous. Do, so do. And but the way of the ungodly shall good. perish. Praise the Lord. Yeah. We're thankful again for I was just praying and thinking of the Lord as I was thinking about the trust factor and it could go on another week because it was so many scriptures talking about the people in the Bible. The Bible is filled with people that came from the first century of creation, if you would, up until the 22nd, 22nd, 23rd century we're living in right now. These people in the Bible times was given to us according to Romans chapter 15, the things were written before time, was written for our learning that we might have patience and hope through the scripture. So if you see what they done, you ought to be able to say, well, they went through it. Man, and they trusted in the Lord. And here's what the Lord began to minister to me last night when I was pondering this in my heart about this message. The Lord began to minister to me that, you know what, James, they trusted in the Lord because I, I myself didn't indwell them. I came upon them and I overshadowed them at times, but God was just telling me, just think, if I wasn't in you, you couldn't walk by faith. Now you walk by faith. Faith is a synonym of trust. But they trusted in the Lord because he didn't embody them, but they, they knew of the goodness of God. They experienced the goodness of God. And when we consider what our lives are, if we go through day-to-day -day endeavors, on a day-to-day -day persecution, if you would, sometimes as Christians, you'd be persecuted. But you might be not persecuted as a Christian, but you may be slandered about something. You're going through something all the time. Life itself is engaging because people are cruel and, and the spirit behind the fact of who they are could be working against you to bring you to a place that lose your witness. Because that's the, that's the thing. You don't want to lose your witness. So you want to always trust in the Lord. When we see men and women in the Bible, the patriarchs, the men and the women, we see that they went through something and they came to a place that they was pinned in a book that we call the Bible. Yeah. And now we look at that and all the way now we see the hardships and the trials they went through. And the Bible teaches us in, in the Ecclesiastes there ain't nothing new under the sun. There ain't nothing new. You're going to experience what they experienced Maybe not the head chopping off and all the things they did in the law and, and the way they had the A-N-E. I'm teaching it on Wednesday night. The ancient Near East, they had cultures and teachings and laws in those times that I'm thankful we don't have. That's right. I can't go and kill a bull off for my sins. I'm just thankful that Jesus is my propitiation for my sins. Hallelujah. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the characters in the Bible. And I want to move swiftly as I can because I wanted to cover this, but I wanted to cover it with a lack of time to be relevant for my audience or for those that may watch that won't get bored because this is some good stuff in the Bible about people. First of all, we'll talk about Joseph. Joseph, you know, he was the one that had a coat of many colors. And Joseph himself was a dreamer. 
Joseph had a gift like you. Joseph had a gift like me. Joseph could see what God wanted him to see and do what God wanted him to do, but yet he didn't understand to the fullness of what God was doing in his life. But he knew that God had a showing him things, visions, dreams, and Joseph seen those things. And Joseph, concerning God's providence, was being sold into Egypt after his brothers put him in the pit. And we call the pit, P-I-T, prophet in training. He was just in time of training. If you're in a pit right now, just think about it. It's a time that you're sitting there in training to go through what you grow through or grow through what you go through. Because it's important to realize, just as Joseph was sitting in that pit, and I've said it like this many times, I'm moving right along. Can you imagine Joseph sitting in that pit, and a cricket down in that pit, making noise over the time period he was in there, of screeching his legs together, making that screeching sound, and Joseph was thinking, this cricket's doing what he's called to do. I'm sitting in this pit. And I don't know what my future is going to last. But I'm trusting in the Lord. Can you imagine him trusting in the Lord and seeking for God's face and not for God's hand? And That's then right. seeking his hand, knowing that he's going to get out of that. So we see that in the Bible about Joseph. And Joseph is a word, name, that's typical of Jehovah. It's typical of Yeshua. It's typical of the names of God. And why? It's just showing us a picture. So we look in, in the book of the Bible in Genesis 50. And let's read a little bit about this. And I'm going to hit a few. Uh, some of them I'll show you in the Old Testament of the reading of the scripture. Then I can carry you back to the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And just show you it's important that we understand that they trusted in the Lord. And he was even indwelling in them. You, you have a privilege that they didn't have. He can be abiding in you and you being seeking his face and drawing nigh to him, being head over heels in love with him, hungering and thirsting and seeking after the Lord our God. And guess what? He's constantly going to fill you and fill you and your trust is going to go into faith and your faith is going to go into hope and your hope is going to continue to grow and you're going to have peace that surpasses all understanding as you walk with the Lord. And that's the key, because it's, it's, it's staring me in the essence of what God is saying when he was speaking it to me. So let's get into the word. I can go on and on about that. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 to 25, we talk about Joseph, how he trusted in the Lord. And watch here. It said, and Joseph said, Unto them. How many times have you been talking to them? You know what they said? <laughs> it's always a way to them. <laughs> but Joseph was talking to them. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am, for am I in the place of God. And that's the key thing of that first verse there on um, trusting in the Lord is you have to be in the place of God. What does that mean, Brother James? Well, I'm glad you asked. When you're in the place of God, you, here's the picture of a cross right here. Straight up, straight out. That's the picture of a cross. So you got to be right with God and then in fellowship with people. And as much as lies in you, you have to live peaceable with all men. That's the picture of the cross. If you're not right with God, more likely you're going to have some issues with people. More likely. And not, not on your recognizance, it could be on their recognizance. But if you're right with God, no matter how many enemies you have, you can still have clarity that God is taking you from, taking you to, and you can have peace in your mind, but no matter who your enemies might be. You can pray for them enemies. Here's what Joseph said. Let me finish this out. Verse 20, he said, after he says, Am I in the place of God? First point of trust. He said, but as for you, you thought evil against me. You know what he's talking to, though? He's talking to his brothers because they put him in the pit. He said, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring the past 
And it is this day to save much people alive. God knew there was going to be a famine in the land. God knew that there was going to be challenges for the people to trust in God to bring about the food and the necessity of what was supposed to be in that time frame to take care of the people. That's why the Bible said to save much people alive because Joseph had the answer. Why? Because he was number one, verse 19, in the place of God. I in the place of God. If you're in the place of God, then you can hear what God is saying. If you can hear what God is saying, this is why Joseph went on to say in verse 21, Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And watch this. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Messar, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. Now all these people, Joseph is getting an opportunity to be a part of their lives. All the way to the third generation of one family, and then brought up son of Manasseh on his knees. Because mm -hmm. he trusted in the Lord. And the Bible said, verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I died. He knew he was going to die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. And I studied that all out just to get a visual on that, because it went back to Genesis chapter 47, verse 29 and 31 through 31, when it says, at the time Jew near that Israel must die. He was Israel at that time. That's right. And he called his son Joseph. And he said unto him, If I found grace in thy sight, I pray thee, my hand, put thy hand under my thigh. And deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. He didn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to be buried with his family. That's right. And in, in those days, they, they, they put their hand on their thigh, and the, putting their hand on the thigh indicated I'm making an oath with you that I'm going to do what you ask me to do. I put my hand on your thigh, it's Satan that I'm going to do it, and you can believe that I'm going to do it. See, that was the way they did it in those days. And we've experienced not the hand under the thigh days, but we've experienced the handshake days. Back in, in, in the time, you may have not be old enough. Some of you may be watching, may not be old enough. But in the time, they shook a hand. And they shook hands. And if somebody saw them shake hands, I saw them shake hands. That was an agreement. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was trust factor. They trusted that that person would do what they said they were going to do. And you go over here to Hebrews 11, and, this, and it brings it back up by Joseph. It said, by faith. Now, here we are with the synonym of trust. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and he gave commandment concerning his bones. Joseph knew what he wanted to happen, and he asked them to do it. And he knew but as he swore, he made him swear unto him that he would bow his head and he would bury his bones, not in Egypt. And that was just a trust factor in that time. And I give you that because Joseph not only trusted that they would do that, Joseph trusted that God had him from the time his brothers were jealous about him and was carrying him through and come up with a plot kill the, sh the, the animal and put the blood on his thing, carry it to the dead. You read the story. But all that, if you know the story of Joseph, all that, Joseph had faith. By Hebrews, there he said he had faith. But we see he trusted in the Lord. When we face battles, and a battle is defined in Webster as an extended contest or struggle or controversy, now, how many times you can categorize that you've had controversy? You was going through a battle. How many times can you categorize that you were struggling? You was going through a battle. 
So when we face battles, we got to realize that the children of Israel faced many struggles. The children of Israel had many extended contests that they went through and controversies that they went through. I'm glad we're not living in that kind of time frame. People say, well, I wish I could live in those days when I could walk with Jesus. Yeah, you, you can't even handle the taxes that's coming against you now that the government's putting on you. How are you going to handle some of the things they done in those days? Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. So here's some things about the Israelites. They knew over 420 plus years they called on God to deliver them out of the taskmaster's hand, out of Egypt. They trusted in him. But when they came out of Egypt and they were going into the promised land to reach the promised land, they went through the wilderness. The wilderness is a type of the church for us. Egypt is the world, wilderness is the church, and the promised land is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So here's the thing we look at with the Israelites. The Israelites was in battle with, with the Canaanites and the Persians and all the Ike brothers. He was, they was in battle with them. And so, but they trusted in the Lord. Every time they trusted in the Lord, guess what? They overcome their enemy. They was victorious. Thanks be unto God, the Bible said, who always, always causes us to triumph if you walk in according to him, if you trust in him. Lean not to your own understanding. But acknowledging him. So we find in First Chronicle 5 just a little story about the Israelites in battle with the Canaanites. Just one little scripture that I had on that. But I want you to see that. In First Chronicle 5 and 20, the Bible says, And they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand. Now, like I said, it's Ike. All the Ike brothers, they, they faced a lot of Ike. I mean, the Habites, the Herdites, the Missites, and I'm just giving you some names. They, they had to face all them, but I'm just talking about it. But they were delivered into their hands. Why? And all that were with them, and they, why? They cried to God in their battle. I just told you a battle was a struggle or a controversy. What do you think they trusted in? They trusted in God. They cried to God in their battle. And guess what? And he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him. I want you to get that right there about the Israelites. Can you imagine? Sometimes I think and, and try to visualize and even experience in my knower the feelings that they felt when they was coming out of the, the one place of bondage Egypt, the world, and then coming into the wilderness to go to the promised land. Can you imagine? How they made an 11 day journey, 40 years, and most of them died out. But yet, they trusted in the Lord, according to the scripture here. God uses people for qualified circumstances. For qualified circumstances. He, he's got something right now he wants to use you for that only you can do. Only you can do it. God doesn't call, you probably heard this, doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. How? Trusting in him. If you trusted in him one time and you seen him come to pass, you know he'll do it again. Because God is a do again in God. He'll do it over and over and over again. Because he's a good, good father. When we talk about integrity, you make a contract of your integrity when you trust in the Lord. When you trust in him and you trust in him, you're starting to make a contract with God. Okay, God, I trust in you. Now your integrity starts to be built because people know you're going to stand firm in the Lord. Well, I don't know uh, who I can get to pray for this. I know I can call on Christian. I know I can call on the nun. I know I can call on so-and-so because they know that your integrity of trusting in the Lord is standing firm. Think about that. Let's look at uh, a woman woman on the behalf of the trusting in the Lord. Rahab was well, in the lineage. You read in Matthew chapter 1 in the, be the beginning of the begots. You begot all the way down to Rahab. Yeah. She was in the lineage of Jesus. That's right. But think about it. And I was pondering this in my mind <laughs> about Rahab. 
Did she know who her grandmama was? Did she know who her great grandma was? Did she know who her great 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 grandma was? She may have not knew that in all essence, but yet the faith or the trust that she had in her was displaying that what she was going to encounter as she became and knew not maybe that she was in the lineage of the Father, in the lineage of Jesus. But we see that in uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua, about the hospitality to the spies that she felt impressed in her heart to do. Why she felt impressed? The Bible says she felt impressed because she remembered what they had done in the early times and heard about the children of Israel coming through the, all the kings that they fought against. Mm -hmm. She had heard about those kings that were triumphant over people, but they didn't triumph over the Israelites when they came through. So we look at Rahab here in Joshua chapter 2. In verse 1, it says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out to Shem two men to spy secrets saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harness house. I didn't mention that, did I? She was a harness. Named Rahab. And they lodged there. And this was the plan of God right here. He sent out, Joshua sent out two men to spy secrets. And the two men just so happened to land in the house of a harness. That's right. Hallelujah. But guess what? God was setting something up here. Drop on down here to verse 9 through 13 of Joshua 2, and we read this. Talking about Rahab. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. And what did and ye excuse me, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og. Must have been some bad dudes at Sihon and Og. Yeah. But he said, Whom ye utterly destroyed. Now I want you to hear that because this is what she began to say after that. She said, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more carriage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, Rahab just heard about what their God had done. And she already knew from her understanding capability that their God was God in heaven above and in earth beneath. She trusted that that was the real, true, and living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because she had just heard about them beating up on the king Og and Sihon and utterly destroying them. Verse 12 said, Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. Now I want you to understand that because this last verse says this, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sister and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So here's the thing I want you to get out of that, that Rahab story. The thing about Rahab she did not, she wasn't selfish. That's why she took in the two strangers as spies. She wasn't selfish because she was thinking about her father. She's thinking about her mother. She's thinking about the brethren around her. She's thinking about her sisters. She's thinking about all of them that were around her that she wanted them to deliver to just because she heard about the God of our Bible, mm -hmm. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah, Shalom. Shalom. He's the God of peace, of the banner, and he's the God of plenty. Hallelujah. So when we look at that story about Rahab, Rahab's hospitality of the spies, 
which is setting her up to trust in the Lord of the God of Israel. And she knew that because she even was mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 and 31. What did it say? By faith, the heart of Rahab perished not. Watch this. With them that believe not. She perished not with them that believe not. When she had received the spies with peace. Can you accept somebody in knowing that with peace? Can you accept somebody in with peace knowing that it may bring havoc on your life? Because you trust in the Lord? Just, just trust in the Lord. Well, I'm going to let them, I'm going to stop and pick up this guy walking down the road. You better not be, he might have a gun. But I'm just trusting in the Lord right here. I'm just feeling in my spirit. The Lord said, pick him up. We stop and picking up Joe Jean. He's walking. It's just like Rahab, because you trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we're talking about some more here. I love these guys here. <laughs> Trusting in the Lord, the trust factor is so important. And looking at these people, they trusted in the Lord. I'm going to talk about the three Hebrew boys. The three Hebrew boys, most people know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. No, a Bendigo. <laughs> Some people say, don't say that. Well, it's the Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and a Bendigo. <laughs> well, somebody said a bad Negro, but anyway, he, he, he could have been. Well, he was Shadrach. That was the name the king gave them, though. That's right. That was the name the king gave them. The name was Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. My God has helped. Who is who God is? Their names meant something. But the king gave them different names. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, we see that story in 13 through 27. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar was a rude and evil king yes, in those yes. days. Sort of like some of the people we see in our <laughs> in our uh, leadership position. That's right. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fear commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true? Now this is what now check this out. I was already studying this and it just blessed my heart because some of the things when I study, I may have not got it when I read it. But when I'm studying it, the Lord began to minister to me because I got my, my spiritual ears on. Watch here. Nebuchadnezzar spake, he didn't name them already, but he spake and said unto them, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. In other words, he was telling them, I'm going to set this backstory here. He said, I'm going to set this uh, image up, my little, my little G-O-D, and then when you hear the music and the psalms and the, and the sack butts and all that play, you bow down to them. And they wouldn't bow down. Right. And they wouldn't eat the king's food. Neither. But here's what he said in verse 15. Go on with this. Now, if ye be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the comet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the saucer, the, the, the ducible, and all kinds of music, that ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So you think about that now, if that's been you. Think about it. And who is, I like this part here, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? See, he didn't know that God, Nebuchadnezzar did. But he was asking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Ananias, Hazariah, Ananias, Ananias, Hazariah, and, and Mishael. I couldn't remember their name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, watch what they said. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, you questioning us about our God. We don't even have to answer you because we trust in our God. But here's what they said, though. They even get a little specific about it. Verse 17, he said, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire, fire and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. 
But if not, it be it known unto thee, O king, and we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want you to hear that because here's the thing about what I got out of this trusting in the Lord. There's always going to be somebody that asks you to do something that's going to be serving the little G.O.D.s. They're going to ask you to come and go with me, come do this, let's do this. Oh, you can do it one time. I heard people say it like this. Oh, you can just do it and ask for forgiveness. That's premeditated sin. Don't premeditate no sin and think God's going to forgive you of it. He ain't going to forgive you because you wasn't repentant. You really wasn't repentant because you wouldn't want to premeditate it. Come on, listen. But he said, O king, we will not serve thy gods or worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And then verse 19 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fear. He got towed up from the floor. And he fall of his visage was changed. Against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it will want to be heated. Heat up seven times more than it will want to be heated. That's a word in right there. Heat it up seven more times. And look here, verse 20 says, And he commanded the most mighty men, the best men he had, that they were in his army, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fire and corners. Watch this. Then, these men were bound in their coats, and their hoses, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fire and furnace. Now watch this. These coats and, and hoses and hats that they had, it wasn't fireproof stuff, okay? It wasn't fireproof stuff. Verse 22 said, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now there's some kind of a trials and tribulations that you might be going through right now. I don't think it's nowhere near what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was facing. I don't think it's nowhere near what Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael was facing. But yet you might be going through something that's a trial to you that may be a furnace of you're going to be in some hot water or a hot temperature if you go through what you're going through. But guess what? Watch this. Verse 24 said, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, or excuse me, astounded, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. Yes. They have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Yes. Now he didn't know what, who God was, but when he saw all this supernatural stuff going on, it was supernatural because they trusted in the Lord. Can you imagine the supernaturalness of being thrown into a pit of fire? And the pit was, of fire was so hot that the men threw, that threw them in burned up. With all their hosiery and their clothing on, they burned up. And the ones in the fire was in the midst of the fire without no harm. Because the Bible goes on to say in these last two verses, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fire first, and he spake and said, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, ye servants of the Most High God. I called them by their name because he said, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael came forth in the midst of the fire. And what this last verse say? And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king counselors began gathering together. Saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was it in hair or their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Hallelujah. Can't you imagine trusting in God so much that not even no smoke, smell of smoke got on you? And you was in the fire. Not even, you, know, you didn't even lose not one of your little hair on your head. 
And you don't have had it. You ever been close enough to the garbage can, throwing your fire in, throwing some garbage in? Now, we don't do that in this area because it's against the law to you know, burn in garbage cans. But if you were throwing your garbage in the can and you stuck your hand out there and that fire singed that hair on your hand, can you imagine your hair getting singed? These people were in the fire and fire seven times hotter and the people got burnt up that was throwing them in there. They trusted in the Lord. Their trust was so profound that not even a hair on their little head or their arms was sin. I've had mine sin just throwing it in, in, in the garbage. I mean, I've seen it done. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can get my point. Praise God. This is a real story of trusting in the Lord. Now, I, 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 I can imagine that was a real deal for Hannah and I, Azariah, and Mishael, knowing that they who they were and called upon the name of the Lord their God. Hallelujah. Amen. Then we talk about uh, Daniel. In the same time frame, the same things was going on with Daniel. And you'll see that in Daniel chapter 6, 1 through 5, first verses I have. We're going to be winding up here shortly. I just want to share with you about men and women that trusted in the Lord. Here's what it says about Daniel. Verse, chapter 6, verse 1 through 5 says this. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Verse 3 said, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, you have to think about that. When you see a small S, it's not speaking of the God, of the spirit of God. It's a small S, it's speaking of, of the spirit of man. But the spirit of man still can have some good characteristics and good behavior. Because he says right here, because the spirit of excellence was in him. The spirit of excellence was in Daniel. Because God designed him as to be who he called him to be. He designed you to be who you called to be. Yes, you have some excellence in you because of God's design. God designed you to walk in excellence. Now, we have to be born again to fulfill all the fulfillments of the what God has said in the abundant life that he wants us to walk in. But anyway, he said, and the king thought it was to set him over the whole realm. Why? He set him over the whole realm because he had a spirit of excellence. The king noticed that Daniel had something special about him. Now, Daniel trusted in the Lord. But the king noticed it, and he set him over the whole realm, the Bible said. The verse uh, four says, Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They go with jealousy. They seen that the king set him up and sought him to be over the whole realm. And these presidents and princes saw that and they sought to find occasion against Daniel. Now there's somebody in the way you want to find occasion against you just because of who they are, just because of the spirit working behind them. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. But watch this. They sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not, they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it, watch this, we said we find it against him concerning the law of his God. In other words, they couldn't find nothing in their own made-up minds and circle of deception and all. They couldn't find anything in their own circle, but they said we can find it in him against the concern of the law of his God, I don't know what they was thinking, but they're going to find something on them. And the Bible says in the last verse of this, of this one, this, you know? 
I thought I had six verses, but I didn't. But anyway, they said he's crying occasionally, but I dropped down to verse 9 in the same chapter to still give you the picture of Daniel's trust in the Lord. Verse 9 through 12 said this. King Darius had already set him up for favor. And all the princes and all the people tried to find something against him according to his God. And the Bible says here in verse 9, Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree, because they knew that Daniel prayed three times a day, facing toward the east, toward what he knew in his own reference of his sermon to the God of his fathers. Daniel would always pray. And they knew that. The, the kings and the priests figured that out. They seen him doing it. So now they go to the king Darius and tell Darius, here's what happened. He prays three times a day to his God. So let's come up with something. You write a decree saying that if you prayed or let's make it against him on his praying to his God. So this is what happened in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into the, his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God and as he did a full time. He was already doing it, but he knew the decree had been written by King Darius, but yet he went on in and done what he was doing because he trusted in the Lord. It wasn't about what man said that was going to change him. It was about how he knew in his heart he trusted in the Lord God, his Almighty. And so he went as a full time. And even after the decree was written, he trusted in God. And he went and he prayed. And this Bible says in verse 11, Then these men assembled, and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Now, you ever notice in the fact that they seen him praying and making supplication before his God. They knew that the decree that Darius had written, that Daniel had broken that decree. Verse 12 says this, Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the dens of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altered not. In other words, he said, Yeah, I wrote this decree, and Daniel then broke it already. Now we got reason to make accusation against him because he prayed to another God and petitioned to another God within the 30 day period that I said not to. You think that moved Daniel? No, because he trusted in the Lord. We drop down to verse 16 in this chapter for the sake of time, and here's what it says. Then King commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he would deliver thee. King said that kind of facetiously, I believe. But verse 17, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet, with the signet of his Lord, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. In other words, he said, lock him in there. He's going to get eight of the line just because he didn't do what I told him to do over this 30-day period. He just messed up. Now he's going to die. The lions are going to eat him for breakfast. That's what they did. Threw him in the mouth of the lion. He goes on to say, in verse, in the mouth of the lion. <laughs> Threw him in the den with the lion. He goes on to say in verse 18. Then the king went into his palace. He passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of the music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Now the king couldn't even sleep that night, but he knew what he had done. Watch this. Verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and he went in haste until the den of the line. He's going to see them that been chop chop on Daniel. The Bible says in verse 20, and when he came to the den, 
he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Now he already sees that happen. King saw that. He wasn't blind, but he's going to question Daniel. See the question mark on the end of that? He questioned Daniel. Now watch what Daniel said. Verse 21. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. What respect he had to the king. He threw me in here, but live forever, king. Live forever. Then he said, My God, verse 22, sent his angel and had shut the lion's mouth, and they had not hurt me for as much as before him innocent. Innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. In other words, whatever you set up to me, king, in other words, innocency, innocency was found in me. God knew I was innocent. So he shut up the mouth of the lion. He sent an angel to shut up the mouth of the lion. Can you imagine an angel coming in there and putting his hands over the lion's mouth? And they were sitting there drooling, wanting to eat Daniel. Mm -hmm. the, mouth, the trust that Daniel had. He said, O king, have I done no hurt? In other words, he started off with saying, Live forever, king. And that phrase, live forever, means peace be to you, king. Peace be to you. The Bible says in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 that blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God, mm -hmm. children of God. And I'm going to tell you something. He trusted in the Lord, Daniel did, and he was referenced as a child of God right then because he knew he was innocent because he trusted in the God of his salvation. Hallelujah. And it is important that we understand when we read stories like this that in those times things like that happened. They occurred about in the middle of the the arena there and made them fight against the lions. That's right. Just for entertainment. That's right. To see the lions kill them. And so you don't want to be in no time like that. No matter who's before you, as followers of the Lord, or who's before you that may have lack of understanding on the biblical concept of the word, be sure as much as lies in you. You seek and serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Why? Because it's up to you to trust in the Lord. God ain't going to judge me over something you did to me. He's going to judge me over how I responded to how you done that to me. It's going to be written under me what I did according to those things. God already, he, people say, you keep it on this. You change it twice. Well, you change it because he's working on you, fashioning and forming you day by day. Do you trust in the Lord? Do you trust in the Lord? I, I'm, I'm going to read this last passage here about Hezekiah, and I'm going to close off on today. I think I got one more, Hezekiah and then Pharaoh. Uh, Hezekiah was one in his Bible that was a king, and he was one of David's ancestors. Here's what it said about Hezekiah. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, Hoshea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Now Hezekiah reigned, I, I, I love to read about the kings that reigned successfully and as unto God. Verse 2 said, 25 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name also was Abba, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did, I like this part here, verse 3, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David's father did. Why did he do what was right in the sight of God? Because he trusted in God. He feared the Lord in, a, in a all who he is. And this is what we got to get in our understanding today. If we trust in the Lord, know that it is he, God, 
God of everything. He created everything and for everything for his glory. And if you understand that, walk according to his will, trust in him, then you'll see the pages turn in your faith. On a day-to-day -day basis, you'll see the pages turn in your faith. Now, the rest of the story said that he removed in high places. High places were where they built up altars and stuff that, that the people were Kings before them would build up high places where they would worship against other gods. And when Hezekiah came in, he, he removed the high places. He break the images and cut down the groves. And he break in pieces the brazen serpents that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did, did burn incense to it. And he called to the Houston. And I want you to get that right there. Even what Moses had did in the midst of the time he was there, there were still people in that time of Hezekiah's reign still burning incense to that thing. Now, I want you to hear that because no matter what you was taught or no matter how you believe, you need to be tearing down images and groves and, and, and brazen serpents and whatever is hidden in your walk with God. That's the Ten Commandments. The first five was toward God. Love the Lord thy God. Not having any graven image. It was how you worship God. And the last was how you worship unto me, how you relate it unto me. But anyway, here's the verse I want you to get. Talking about Hezekiah. The word trust. The word trust here. The Bible says in verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. So that after him was none like him among all kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he claimed to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandment, which the Lord commanded Moses. Now here's the key in, in Hezekiah's life. Hezekiah was a man that tore down everything that didn't look like God, that tore up, that wasn't God, and he trusted the Lord. And not only did he trust him, there was he left a legacy. There was nobody before him or after him that was done just like Hezekiah did because he made a precedent of who he is because he trusted in the Lord. He claimed to the Lord, the Bible said, and he departed not from following him. That's the key to trusting in the Lord. Depart not from following the Lord and keep claim to him. Seek him. Ask, seek, knock, wrap your arms around him, love on him, come into his living room, and set up in his lap, as John, the, the Apostle John did. Do that and watch God do great and mighty things because you trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All these people I've shared with you, Hezekiah, Joshua, Rahab, Joseph, Daniel, Jadrach, or Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, all these men and women trusted in the Lord. And let's talk about the last thing in reference to obedience. Even in the time that Israel was waiting on God to deliver them out of the hand of bondage, and they asked God to deliver them, and they cried out to God, and they cried out to God, and they cried out to God. Even in the midst of Egypt, they cried out to God, waiting on God to send a deliverer. And we know that Moses, his name means drawn out. And Moses' name is symbol symbolically as a name church, because the name church is the word ecclesia, and it means to draw it out of one. So Moses was the symbol of Jesus as a savior in the time that brought Israel out of their situations and circumstances. Because ten plagues that God sent to the Pharaoh to show him through Moses' uh, leadership that God was sending Moses to say, let my people go. God wanted Moses to go forward to say, let my people go, where the people could come and serve him. And that's all God wanted with us. Just serve him. He wants us to serve him wholeheartedly. If you seek him, he'll be found in you. If you seek him wholeheartedly. 
So as we begin to close this out, I'm going to share with you about the, when Pharaoh was doing what he did and how they obeyed the Lord in his Bible after the seventh plague in reference to the hell that was given and how the children of Israel being in a safe place of God, knowing that he would prevail because they trusted in him. Hallelujah. We find this right here in Exodus chapter 9, 20 through 26, as we can begin to close. The Bible says, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And what's the key thing we find out here about trusting in the Lord? It says right here, you fear the word of the Lord. What does the word say about that? Somebody asks you a question or asks you something, you tell them what the word say, and guess what? You trusted in the Lord to bring that understanding to their knowledge. And if they don't understand, then you say, just read it for yourself. It's in the Bible. And find out where it's at and let it be done. Because it says, he feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Moses. Verse 22 says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, and there may be hell in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of field throughout the land of Egypt. And watch this. It got pretty tore up around there, pretty, pretty shaky. In verse 23, it says, And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained the hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it began a nation. God brought all those plagues, and the seventh plague, and that's, I don't know why the seventh, but the seventh is what God carried me to. Seventh is the number of completion. So God brought the seventh plague of hell and fire and mingled with the hell, and it was grievous, the Bible said. It was so grievous that it just, watch this, it was so grievous that the hell smoked throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hell smoked every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. The hell was so big, he was breaking the tree limbs. Can you imagine how big a hell? We've seen golf ball size hell. You ever seen hell big enough to break a tree limb? That's what was going on. It says right there, only, I like this, this is the last verse, but I want you to hear this. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hell. And I asked the Lord, what trust factor was in that? Here's what the Lord showed me. In the book of Exodus, verse 20 through 26, all the hell that happened, the only people that was covered was the one that was in Goshen. You know what the word Goshen means? I know you may not, but here's what the word Goshen means. Drawing near. Drawing near. If you're drawing near to God, you're trusting him. The Bible says draw nigh to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. So if you're drawing near to God, you're in a place called Goshen, according to the biblical context of this scripture. And guess what? Nothing shall befall, befall you that's on those that's around you. People say, well, well, all this is going on, and he got so much peace, or she got so much peace, because I'm in Goshen. I'm drawing near to God. While you sitting up here, ooh, the despair and agony old me, I'm praying and believing and trusting in the Lord. I'm praying and believing and trusting in the Lord. I'm drawing near to God. I'm in Goshen. And even the Bible says at one time, when, when it was dark and all over the earth there, it was light in Goshen. It was even light in Goshen when the earth was so dark that nobody could see their hand in front of them. And it was light in Goshen. And guess what that means? It was light. When you're drawing near to God. Just keep drawing near to God. Keep trusting in God. That's what he wants. 
And when we look at that scripture there, it says that uh, one one word in there can back up. I right hear what it says. Stretch up your hand. The word Israel was the word I was trying to get. But I looked up that word Israel. The word Israel means God prevails. God prevails. And I don't know about you, but I can tell you right now, if you trust in the Lord, you know that God will rule as God. If you trust in the Lord, drawing near to Him, God will prevail. He will always prevail. Just as all these plagues was done, they were done to show God Himself as being mighty and His people being covered as they trusted in Him. That's what the story is about. If you trusted in the Lord in those days, you used to see history repeat itself in the biblical context of the world. Those that trust in the Lord, they got peace. And those that trust in the Lord, they're drawing near and they have light and that God is prevailing in their life. But those that are not, they got havoc. They have havoc. And they can create that yourself because you don't trust in the Lord. I just want you to get a message here out of that today. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him that he will direct your path. Come to your ear, because God is speaking. He's speaking in these days for sure, because so many people are being deceived, and they're believing a lie. And they call it good evil, according to Isaiah's prophecy. They call it good evil. And guess what? Some people are going to fall by the wayside because of that very thing. Mm -hmm. Some won't, because they trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. The trust factor is for you to continue to trust in the Lord, and walk according to his will and his purpose. And I grant you, you can't go wrong. Hallelujah. You can't go wrong. Thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. And at the end of the day, nothing is going to be worth anything but what you've done for the glory of God. At the end of the day, what did you do for the glory of God? Because you trusted in him. Hallelujah. And as always, if you ever want to do anything for this ministry, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. I said it three times. I wasn't hung up. I just said it repeatedly. Pray for us because we can do the will of the Father. And if you don't want to give, there's a way you can give. Three three different ways you can give with your face in the place at 5751 Mount Gear Road, Cedar Grove, Tennessee, 38321. Or you can give by Cash App, IHP Ministry, or you can give by PayPal, paypal.me forward slash IHP ministry. To God be the glory. Thank you. Give God all the praise. Trust in Him, and He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Amen.